Well, welcome. I'm Jane Damon, your host for Talking Art in Maine. It sure is good to be back. And uh, I hope you all, if you weren't here for the last one, um, I hope you all recovered from COVID. And uh, if you experienced loss, my heart goes out to you. And please reach out to this community. It's a very loving place, and they will help you get through whatever you're going through. Well, tonight we have a very special guest, Philip Fry, who I'm excited to introduce you to. I sent you the bio of his, well, a basic bio, but this, I'm going to just go through a few notes of history about him um, before we start our conversation. He is part of a distinguished line of artists whose muse is the main landscape and the coastal life here. He was born in Portland in 1967 but he was raised in Bedford, Massachusetts. His Navy father moved the family across the U.S. and Europe until they settled in Maine when Fry was 13. At Ellsworth High School, his first art mentor, Kenneth, Kenneth Mike, encouraged Phil's artistic talent, and later he took workshops at the Haystack Mountain School in Deer Isle and attended the Maine Summer Arts Program where he studied under master artist Alan Bray who sat in this seat a few years ago. I don't know if you remember. Um, Fry received a full scholarship to Columbus College of Art and Design in Ohio, one of the top 10 commercial art schools in the country. In 1988, he transferred to Syracuse University's College of Visual and Performing Arts, where he explored fine art, aesthetics, and art history. And after receiving a BA from Syracuse, he backpacked to England and Scotland and spent time at the National Gallery and the Tate Museum, where he saw works of Turner, Rembrandt, Matisse, and other ma masters. He returned to Maine and became a practitioner of Zen, Buddha, Dharma, which I hope we will learn more about <laughs> later. And over the next 10 years, made several trips to India and Nepal to study, the Buddhist teach to study with Buddhist teachers. Back in Maine, Phil set up a studio while still an active member of the Buddhist community. He worked many jobs to make a living while exploring abstract and figurative themes in his paintings, which were inspired by his surroundings. By 2000, he began to paint outdoors full time. His love of Maine landscape and his ability to pare down what he sees, what he sees to planes and blocks of color and light result in paintings that hover between representational and abstract. His scenes are peaceful, but his energetic brushwork gives excitement to his canvases. Phil, welcome to Thank Talking you. Art in Maine. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank I have you. a question. Sure. You were accepted at a very good commercial art school. Mm -hmm where when you got out, you would get a job. Right, right. And you gave that up and went, what, it was a leap of faith to go to an art school, yes. a liberal arts school. What did your parents say? Uh, they were a little petrified. <laughs> 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 yeah, but they always had faith in me, which was great. That is great. Which is really great. I'm That's very not fortunate. always, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so you were, you felt, felt you had made the right decision. Yeah, well, you know, I was just sort of following my gut and sort of my, my passion. And, um, and I knew that I could probably make a living, as, as you said, as a commercial artist or, or something like that. And, but I knew I wanted to do something different. And what made you think you wanted to do something different? You know, I really wasn't sure at yeah. the time. I yeah. mean, it was, it was see, the, the, the work that I studied in college, you know, and then the backpacking you know, through uh, England and Scotland and going to the, museum, the museums and seeing the greats, it, I, I was inspired by that. You were. And um, I didn't see, I didn't see the uh, sort of the graphic design in there. I saw this sort of, this life of, as an artist, of, of an artist, and I wasn't quite sure what that meant, um, but I was gonna figure it out. You were gonna figure it out. And then you got drawn to, you were drawn to Buddhism mm -hmm. uh, before you actually started becoming an artist? Or uh, as you were becoming? As I was becoming it, mm -hmm. yeah, as I was becoming an artist. I mean, as you pointed out earlier, I, I, I studied with um, Ken Mike and then 
Alan Bray. Mm -hmm. And um, Ken Mike was instrumental in sort of, he gave me Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind when I came back to do a little bit of teaching at Ellsworth High School. The so, book, Zen Mind, yeah, Beginner's Mind. Yeah, uh, it's by Suzuki Roshi. And um, so I studied that a little bit, read it, and I was very inspired by it. It was sort of like, it was me sort of recognizing something in terms of a, a spiritual path that I wanted to investigate. Mm. So, um, so that came along um, as I was becoming an artist and sort of co-concurrently or however you want to say that. Yeah. Yeah. So it all kind of blended. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's look at some of this beautiful artwork. Um, this painting is called, I've got to get my glasses on, Ball in the Hall. And uh, we will, um, you will notice that there are blocks of color. There are, there are rectangles of color. There are um, all very simplified shapes, except for the two, and they're all hard edged, except for the, two, for the ball and the light. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is what you love. You yes. love to simplify. Yes. Talk about that a little. Well, part of the simplification process is, for me has come from uh, my background as an artist and some of the teachers that I had. And um, I did watercolor early on and I was very drawn to some you know, Japanese and Chinese uh, calligraphy and then some of the abstract expressionists um, like uh, Franz Klein and so forth. So those artists sort of inspired me to say, how, how can I get the essence of, of something? Mm. And sort of really paring down. Mm. And um, one of the professors I had at, uh, at Columbus College of Art and Design, Ernie Viveros, um, he had us doing these gesture drawings of the figure. And the figure, you know, 30 second or minute long gesture drawings where you had to get the essence of this of this model standing mm. on the platform. Mm. And so you, I learned a ton about simplification in that process. Well, you're very good at it. Not everybody would be able to do that, oh, I think. Oh, thanks. Um, who was it that I've got this? Oh, um, George King, Kinghorn yes. of the U of Mass Museum, mm -hmm. who had a, I mean, U of Maine Museum had a show for you, said, you have the remarkable ability to simplify complex environments into dynamic planes of color. And that's what it is, really. Mm -hmm. it's, you've, you've taken out all the detail. Yeah. Well, part of the process for me is when I'm looking at something, I'm trying to, uh, I actually will squint my eyes or, or now take my glasses off <laughs> and sort of see sort of the gesture or the simplification of it. Here's one that's really simplified. Mm. It's amazing. You know what it reminds me of? Marcel Proust said, "You don't. the voyage of discovery is not in seeking new landscapes, but in see, seeing new with new eyes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The You're keeping seeing the with new eyes. Yeah, it's very fresh. So who are some of your heroes artistically? Uh, well, I named one of them Franz Klein, um, Matisse. Um, Gosh, you know, Cezanne, mm. they're sort of the, you know, mm -hmm. the, the biggies. Um, those are sort of the, the main ones. Um, what did you learn from Phil Frey? You liked, I mean, from, uh, it's not Phil, Bray. Oh, Alan Bray? Alan Bray. Well, Alan, that, I went, it was the Main Summer Arts program that I went to with him, and that's, that program's no longer, but he had each of us students doing this project where we had, uh, he gave us a box with an object inside. We did not know what the object was. It was a box probably about four, you know, four by four or a cube sealed box. So we had to move it around and figure out what it was and then do a drawing of it. And so- You mean feel it with your hand or yeah, just you move had to the move box? It, listen to it, you're doing all this and you're, and mine was a, a pen cap. So it slid one way, it rolled the other way, you know, and then, so everybody had, each student had a different thing. So you had to figure out what it was, do a drawing of it. And the other key one was doing something, doing a painting or a drawing from a different perspective. So he had this box of objects that each of us, we went and picked. He didn't ask us to pick 
you know, he didn't give them to us, we picked them. Um, a fellow student picked a, a model boat. I picked this sort of, it was like a, some sort of obelisk or something. It was made out of metal, had a little sculpture on it, relief. And he said, I want you to draw it from the inside out. Oh, that is interesting, really. Yeah, yeah. A little challenging. Yeah, it was very challenging. So it, it was kind of like the, um, some of you might know um, Inuits and some Native American tribes draw paintings or what have you from up in the corner looking down. Oh, right. And heard that. so sort of from the eagle eyes view, and mm -hmm. it reminded me of that. Mm -hmm. But it was very challenging in terms of like, how, how would I draw these flowers from, from the inside from in out, there yeah. looking out or from the water looking out? So it, it helps you sort of look at things differently and sort of uh, explore, keep an open mind. Do you use that in your teaching? Uh, I've tried to in, in the past. Yeah, I've done it with kids. <laughs> Adults haven't really taken to it too well. <laughs> they like, say, what? no, I won't do that. <laughs> you are a popular teacher. Is oh, teaching thanks. fun for you? Yeah, it is. It's very Did much. Do you learn a lot? I, lo I, th I mean, this is no secret, I don't think, but I think teachers learn more from the students than, <laughs> than the students learn, I think. Um, Maybe they both Maybe it goes yeah, both ways. Yeah, it's, it's a two-way street. I mean, I'm always amazed at what the, my students paint mm. and that each one of us can be painting this still life oh. of flowers and everybody does it differently. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? It's, it's amazing. Yeah, we're all creative. Yeah. Uh, okay, this one's called From the Harbor and talk about abstract shapes. Mm. Um, and again, George Kinghorn, his steadfast devotion, he's talking about you, to perceptual painting, to what lies before him in the here and now has yielded an abundance of honest and beautiful painting. Why do you prefer to paint outside in plain, plain mm. air or plein air as they say in France? Well, I think there's a little bit of pressure when you're outside, pressure and enjoyment. Maybe pressure is not quite the right word, but it's you're outside in the elements and um, the things, bugs, the bugs, the wind, sun, bugs and rain, you know, all, <laughs> all of that happening. And it's um, and things are constantly changing. Yeah. So that has taught me to try to get the essence of of the of the object, you know, of the landscape or whatever it is. And when I'm painting indoors in the wintertime and I'm looking at, you know, reference, you know, painting from my iPad, um, I try to instill that same kind of energy. Mm -hmm. And how I do that sometimes is I do sketches, you know, I'll do a pencil sketch of the photograph, you know, of the of what's on the iPad. And then I will shut the iPad off halfway through the painting process and I won't look at it anymore. So I'm then, like with this piece that we're looking at, um, I'm trying to break things down into their simple shapes, yet try to get the essence of, what, of what's happening. And mm -hmm. in this particular one, it's, it's looking at the movement of the water and the wind and all of that where, you know, so when you're out in, you know, out in, outside doing it, that's happening. Um, and sometimes you have, sometimes you, you, you have to try to, how do you represent something that's moving? Yeah. And, you know, like the water or the clouds or what have you. Or so the you, sun or whatever yeah, is happening. The shadows, it's happening in yeah. real time. Yeah. It's a very exciting process, mm. I think. Mm -hmm. It's invigorating. <laughs> Challenging. Mm. Yes, that too. <laughs> Um, Fisherman's palette, this is 30 by 40. Oh, keep uh, track of your questions because we will have a Q&A afterwards. If you have to ask something right now and you can't wait, just shout out, we'll take you. <laughs> but we'd rather do it at the end. Um, okay, talk about color. Mm. Well, and anything specific about color? Um, well, you seem to, you definitely like color. Mm, yeah. Uh, I, I think you love blue. Yes. Blue is the most popular color in the world. Did you know that? I believe it. Yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. 
well, I guess the sky is blue and the water is blue, yeah. so we, we're used to it. Yep. But um, a lot of your paintings do have bright color, mm -hmm. and uh, I assume since you like Matisse, you yes. like color. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think with, um, with color, it's, I go through different phases of what I'm looking at and what I'm focused in, on in terms of color. And, <clears throat> you know, as you mentioned, Matisse and the Fauves, um, those, you know, the, the high key palette, I've experimented with, you know, very high key palette where everything's, you know, uh, very little neutral color and mostly purer tones. Seeing how that plays and how I can balance a piece with mm -hmm. that and move the focus, you know, with this one, sort of those buoys being the, the focus and then, you know, the other areas. Um, I think with this one, I, I started to do a bit more neutrals with this in terms of the shed, you know, the shack and then the other areas, the fog. Um, and, and I've been doing more of that these days where I've been trying to play more with playing sort of the pure tones off of the more neutral tones. Well, I think they show brighter if you do that. Yeah, you? exactly. Yeah. And um, so... A couple of years ago, I kind of pushed the envelope of, of high key stuff, and maybe you have some paintings in here that show that. But um, and then sometimes I get paintings back, and it's like, wow, did I do that? that that's <laughs> that's a little too intense. <laughs> oh, well, I don't think I picked any of those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, I thought maybe you chose scenes that had colors that you liked. For example, yeah, those were real colors of rope. Yeah. Rope can be those colors. I mean, I don't know if they were that day. Yeah, but they were. Yeah. And you seem to really like to paint what you're looking at. Yeah. That's what you prefer. You don't like to make stuff up. It's true. It's true. It's, it's when I'm driving along or walking along somewhere and I see a scene that catches my eye. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes I'm driving along and I wish that my eyes could like snap a picture of what I had just seen. Someday I'm sure it will happen and maybe it, it already is somewhere. <laughs> but um, where you can sort of catch that, that, that glimpse or yep. that how the light is striking someone or something. Well, like the next one, let me show you. <laughs> yes, yep. Now that one is just a few strokes of the brush, but we know exactly, we can feel the weight of that body. Mm. Yeah. It, this is an interesting piece in that um, the, uh, the woman that modeled for me, she had been doing some modeling for a long time. And um, in this particular piece, I wanted to sort of harken back to some of the days in, in college where it was just sort of a pure figure painting. Nothing else in it. Um, I had other things early on in the painting, like it, she was laying on the rug and so forth. And I took all that stuff out because oh. it was so superfluous. Yeah. Because what was real, the real focus was her back mm -hmm. and um, the figure of the form. And I remember in college where one day I had, I had, I was the lucky, the lucky or the unlucky student that had the back, you know, and there's, there's Oh, you mean other people who were sitting around? Everybody, or, yeah, everybody's yeah. around the, yeah. the model and, um, and the back, there's not much. Right. Depending on how the light is striking yep. the back. Um, so it's. And also, you know, thinking about Matisse, when I, I mean, uh, Cezanne, when I was doing this, in terms of if you hearken back to his, his apples and his oranges, still yeah. lives, yeah. where um, he was taking and making facets of those. You can see the little blocks of color. Right, that's so, what you've done here. Yeah. Hmm. And is there any significance to the fetal position? You're not really painting your feelings. You're painting what you're looking at, right? Yeah. 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 So the fetal position doesn't matter. No. No. no it was just it, no psychological thing there. Nope. Nope. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> you can put it on there if you want. It's, um, <laughs> right. That's up people, to you, the people viewer. People love to do that. <laughs> I love her uh, ponytail and all. You've done a beautiful job with that. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, this one is called Here and Beyond, um, very peaceful. Talk about how Zen and mm -hmm. the practice has affected your artwork. Yeah. I can feel some of these paintings that are so peaceful, and mm -hmm. I feel like maybe that's 
mm -hmm. coming from your Zen yeah, uh, practice. I, I think so. Um, I've always been drawn to uh, peaceful environments, and I think we all are in, in one way or another. I mean, we're sort of, we, we, want, we want contentment, we want peacefulness, we want happiness, and, um, and we don't want the opposite. And um, so with the, the Buddhist training that I've done over the years, the meditation training, it's, it's training um, one in being present and being peaceful and clear and calm. And so I've, drawn, I've been drawn to those spaces that elicit that. Um, and, it's, and I think that just possibly just kind of naturally comes about when I'm, when I'm painting. So the, the initial part is maybe this catch of, of light, like this one was walking through this house and having that sort of, that light coming through there and it brought me this joyful, peaceful feeling to, to look at it and then want to paint it. And so um, I think the painting is successful if I've sort of if done that. So you find peace and tranquility in a space, are yeah. you saying, and probably meditation? Yes, yeah. What and else does Zen, how, how else do you, uh, I, I read somewhere that you lived without running water I and did. electricity for 14 years or uh, something? 17. It's a long time. It, I had electricity. You I, did, I just but didn't no have running, running water. water. <laughs> I, running wasn't, water. <laughs> I wasn't completely roughing it without <laughs> electricity. But that's pretty, that's a long time not to have running water. Yeah, well, it, it, yeah, it is. Um, what did you learn from that? Uh, appreciation. For running water? Yes, <laughs> appreciation for running water. Yeah, in, in, you know, I had an outhouse and I had a hand pump and um, that's how I had my water and I went into the Y or like three times a week to oh. do a workout and get my showers and stuff like that. That's a lot of work. It was a ton of work, it was a ton of work. But it was also, it, it gave me a lot of appreciation for, um, for how much work it is to, to to get the water and right. um, to have the water and um, appreciation to this day, every time I turn on a, yeah. you know, the tap. It's, You're grateful. Mm. Gratefulness yeah. is a huge thing. Oh, it's huge. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. huge. Makes you happy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's part of the practice, you know, part of the, uh, the Buddhist practice for me is that's one of the practices is appreciation practice or rejoicing practice. Huh. We're rejoicing in, in the flowers in front of us and the meal that we just had and um, all of you and this opportunity. You know, it, it's endless, you know, the things. Endless the things you can be grateful oh, for. Oh, yes, yes, endless, right. endless. Right. You know, that we can breathe. <laughs> That's a big one. Okay, this is called, I can't believe he called. <laughs> so you've got blocks of color above her, I guess that's a window, and then blocks of color on the rug to balance them. Hmm. And, and that wonderful reduced um, brushwork showing her dress and everything without any detail. Hmm. But you know exactly what it is. So that's uh, yeah. That's what you're so good at. Thank you. This is a this is a fun piece. Um, this friend of mine, Lila, who's an actress, uh, lives out in L.A. and has her uh, mom lives in uh, on Mount Desert Island. And we had the session where we got together, and I took a ton of photographs and then painted this. And it it's funny that I had painted this and then. She started up a, a courtship with, with a, a friend of, you know, started up this relationship with a friend of hers. And then I happened to name this painting. I can't believe he called. And of course, they're married now. So it's such a great, great little story that <laughs> sort of happened concurrently. I hope she has that painting. She does. She does. But, now here's one that's, I didn't put these in any order. This one is a very recent painting. I think, one yes. of your newest. Yep, very recent. Very abstract. Hmm. Um, it looks like some of the colors of the shadows of the rock could almost sink into the background because of the same color as the green hmm. grass. Talk about this a little bit. So this 
painting, this happened uh, during the last year, uh, during sort of all of our uh, isolation that we've had during COVID. And I did a lot of walking behind my house and um, hiking and walking and just exploring. And so, cause we all had a lot of time. And um, so I was out there and I had come across this rock a few times in, in the winter time, you know, skiing and stuff like that. And I wanted to see it in the, in the fall, in the springtime. Mm. Um, so this particular piece, I was drawn because of the split, obviously. I mean, yeah. it's such an unusual rock, this huge piece of granite that split three ways like this, like sliced like bread. And um, so I was interested in the shapes, but also the texture of, of the moss and the lichen growing around it and on it and um, just for it, its abstract shape, just for that in and of itself was what drew me to it. The abstract quality of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So COVID, tell me how COVID affected you. Um, well, I think like everyone else, I was uh, shocked and like, okay, what's gonna happen? You know, no, none of us really knew what was going to happen. And so, um, it, it took me a while to sort of settle in, in terms of what I wanted to do with my work. And um, because there wasn't, you know, galleries shut down and everything shut down, as you well know. Um, so I just started exploring, you know, looking back at some of my work and then some of the older pieces and seeing what threads I wanted to pull on and uh, see things I wanted to explore. Your studio's still in your house. Right? No, no. Oh. Um, I used to have it. My to give you a, a, a sense, my house is like 588 square feet, so it's very, very small. Oh. Um, I recently renovated it, and it has running water now, so you all can relax. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can relax a little bit, and have a nice hot shower. Um, but if I have a separate studio space. Um, it's a renovated garage and which is probably about the, twice the size of my house. Mm. Um, and I renovated the studio in the last couple of years. So um, I have a space that's really, really nice. And nice. Um, I'm very happy about that. Well, you could get to it. It wasn't closed down during COVID. You could no, go there. No, my yeah. commute was rough. It was about 50 feet from my house. <laughs> so it was like... Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. I felt grateful during COVID because my studio is in my house. Yeah. I would much rather have a small house and a large studio like you have. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I felt grateful that I could go to my studio because yes. so many artists couldn't get to a studio because yeah. it was closed. Right, right. And if it was in a big building, they couldn't paint. Yeah. yeah. They had to paint in their house somewhere, find a place. Yep. So that was lucky. Yes, very lucky. And I think also I, I refocused my energy towards uh, the natural world, like I think a lot of people have. Um, right. You know, and some, some people, you know, gardening or hiking or, mm. you know, being outside mm. in various ways. And for me, it was exploring the, the, the area around my house um, and also uh, the garden. You know, I spent, I, I have a big flower garden and vegetable garden um, that I work in. And you I didn't have for, that before COVID or you? I did, but I did. just sort of focused my, yeah. I, you know, because we were, I'm sitting on my, on my deck outside on my, on my, uh, by my house. So I was looking at this garden every day and it's like, well, I'm going to do more to this. So, <laughs> you know, just, and so now I have flowers like these irises and other flowers to paint. Um, so maybe it'll be one day like Monet's garden, perhaps. No water lilies there, but. <laughs> maybe vegetables. Yes, vegetables and, yeah. Yeah. Um, you were a residency fellow um, on Great Cranberry Island for the Helicker Lahoten mm -hmm. Foundation. Yep. Tell us about that. So uh, that is on Great Cranberry Island and um, Helliker Lahoten were two uh, New York artists that uh, Robert Helliker and, oh, I can't remember the first name of the other artist. Uh, anyway, mm. um, so they had this place on Great Cranberry Island and um, 
it was set up as a as a residency foundation after they passed away mm. and um, so every year uh, since then they had a group of artists that came and mm. had a residency I think it was like five to seven artists and I was there in September was it September September of 2012 I think and so I had probably the most amazing studio ever Really? Uh, it was absolutely incredible. It was on this, uh, what they called the pool on Great Cranberry Island. Maybe some of you have been there. And uh, you could see the sun rise and you could see the sun set Ooh. from this Windows 360. Oh, nice. And, um, and then a tidal pool that you could see the, the tide coming in and the tide going out and all the animals coming in and the animals going out. And wow. So uh, the only... The only downside was the vicious mosquitoes. Oh. Um, the, the, the main house where we were staying in my studio was, was probably like 200 feet. But if you weren't quick, you got bit four or five times between there and, the, oh. and it didn't matter any time of day. Oh. So, yeah. But anyway, that's a side. But it was, the, the opportunities there were just incredible in terms of uh, what you could paint. And in here, this particular painting was uh, the dock where the island, summer island kids would hang out and dive off of the dock between the ferries coming in and going out. And oh, oh. It, so it, it was kind of hairy. It was, it was hairy. a scary thing for it, them and it was... It was less scary for the children, it was more scary for the parents. <laughs> And there's maybe like one. How about the doc, the the, uh, the, the guy driving doctor. the ferry? <laughs> he was very much used to it. Oh, yeah, yeah. They all knew each other, and it it felt like free. Like all of us probably remember having some point in our uh, youth where we had sort of these free range summers, yeah. where you could go and do whatever, and you weren't being hovered over by right. a parent. Um, and this was this felt like you were going back in time mm. to that, mm. and. Um, here, well, it's a kind of a rite of passage for these kids to drum, ju have the courage to jump in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So did you, you did this while you were sitting on the dock? I did not, no. Oh, well, no, that I would have been a, a, a really major yeah. trick. So um, how did you do, did you take pictures? I or? took a whole bunch of photographs of this, and uh, when I got back to the studio, I, I worked on it. Uh -huh. And um, this was, the, the photograph was as you see it, so to speak. I didn't really have to move anybody in the to around to sort of get the right. composition that I wanted. All right. Well, you took a lot of photographs. I did. I yeah. took a ton. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, this is another one. This is called Inside Out. Mm. Yeah. And similar to some of the others we've seen. Anything you want to say about this one? Well, um, I like that green. Yes, the green coming through the windows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Chartreuse or whatever. Yes, yes. I, I think with this one, I wanted to challenge myself with interiors because I hadn't done a lot of interiors. And as a landscape painter, you know, you sort of get used to a particular palette of colors that you're using. And um, of course, I still used some of those by looking through the window. Um, but <laughs> I, I wanted other things objects and colors to play with mm -hmm. and uh, things in terms of composition to play with. Mm. Um, so this was a challenge and it was, it was, it was a blast uh, working mm -hmm. with this piece. Mm. Actually, these two paintings are somewhat connected. The okay. last one and this one in the sense of both were uh, John Singer Sargent is another of, of my artistic uh, influences. Um, and I think it's, uh, you help me out here with this one, Lily, Lily, Rose. Um, Don't know. Some of you may know it. Uh, it's Do with, you? Anyone? Does anyone know that painting? Uh, it's uh, Lily, Lily, Rose. It, one of them has, uh, there, it's a field of uh, sort of dark green like this painting, but there's two young kids, a watering can and some lilies and some roses. Um, uh, anyway, it's, it's some, this inspired, was inspired by that. In the previous painting, um, there is a, uh, a portrait of uh, Madame X on a, in a 
one of the teaching things that I used for my class because that was inspired by a workshop that I had done that's ah. interior space. Oh. Oh. So there was a little thing of Madame yeah. X in there. Yeah. Mm. Liquid movement, mm. this is called. You know Wendell Berry, the American mm -hmm. novelist, mm -hmm. essayist? He said, know intimately the place you live. I think you know it intimately. Mm -hmm. After, these, after this many paintings of this place in yeah. Maine, I think you have a pretty good idea yes. of what you're painting. Could you just think of the size of some of these? Sure. This one is uh, 18 by 24. Mm -hmm. And the previous one was 24 by 24. And this one's called Liquids and Solids. Mm. And it's 18 by 24. Do you like to teach? I do. Yeah. You, you have quite a few workshops. I do, yeah. This year I've, I've pared down my workshops a little bit. Uh, this winter time I did a lot of Zoom workshops. Oh, did you? How did that work out? It was actually excellent. Yeah. How do you do that over Zoom? You, you, uh, they show you what they're doing and you talk about it? Or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I send out a very detailed explanation of what it is that I want the students to do. So they're setting up a still life or photographs that they're working from at home. Mm. And, um, and I do like a pre-critique before the workshop starts. Mm. So, mm. They're, so everyone's ready to go mm. and they're painting for the two, say it's a two day workshop. Um, and, um, and the critiques that I do, I do through Zoom, but on an iPad, in a app called uh, Procreate. Procreate. Yeah, <laughs> Procreate. And uh, <laughs> so um, it's a really great piece of software mm. where they send me a digital image of their painting. I put it into the piece of software. And then in real time, all of the students at the same time can see me digitally make comments. I can change, oh. I can sample color, you know, oh. tap my finger on a, and sample that color and change a shape, change the color, and all of that, where in an in-person workshop, I, I would have to, if the student let me, change their painting with the paint and mix and all of that stuff, and all the students couldn't see me. Yeah, um, this is, everybody can see Everybody you can see you at, at the same time. And you're time. not t touching the painting. Exactly, which I was always very nervous about, right. and I always asked the right. student about, because, right. you know, who wants someone else to yeah. work on their painting? So, um, even if it's an instructor. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is called Luminous Harbor. It's 36 by 48. That's quite large. Mm -hmm. um, you said, I don't attempt to capture a moment or a scene. Rather, I work with the inspiration as a means to experience the present. Tell me the difference between working to capture a moment and working as a means to experience the present. Mm -hmm. What's Meaning the difference? Well, I mean, as I said there, I'm not trying to capture a moment, right? Is that what I said? I think. Oh, okay, you said, I don't, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't attempt to capture a moment or a scene. Mm -hmm. I work with the inspiration as a means to experience the present. Right. There's right. a fine line there, but tell me what you yeah. mean. Yeah. So, you know, oftentimes we, we sort of, we we've probably all have said it, where I'm trying to capture a scene, I'm, I'm, we take pictures to sort of, capture the moment, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? And, um, but that moment has passed. And so, and now we have a representation of what, what, has, what was in the past. We have this thing in front of us. So what I'm trying to do when I'm painting is sort of ex experience, experience it. And I'm not trying to, and, Maybe you'll, you'll all pull, poke holes in my logic here, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to experience the act of painting without holding on to it. Okay, so it's Does the that process yes. that is what you're after. The process, yes. not the result. Yes. Yes, I get yeah. it. I get yeah, it. Yeah, process versus, versus product has sort right. of been said before. Um, so if I feel like I'm continually in the process, sort mm -hmm. of, you know, mm -hmm. letting go, letting go, mm -hmm. letting go, and just going along with the process of painting, um, 
I feel like the painting has more juice. It has, it's more alive because okay. versus trying to uh, capture something. A so moment. Speak, a moment. That's so already speak, gone by. That's already gone by. To okay. me, that feels like, all right, I, I have to go back. How, what was that like? And, you know, all of that okay. sort of stuff. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To me, it, it feels more laborious. Mm. Um, where other, other artists might, that might, might be, okay, yeah, that's what I'm doing. And that's completely legitimate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's what sort of yeah. I'm trying to do. Okay, this one's called Mondrian's Ice Fishing Shack. And you know why that's Mondrian. Okay, 30 by 40, Yeah, this one. Um, do you like Mondrian? I do, <laughs> yes. Because yeah. he has those straight lines, too. Yes. And likes those blocks of color, and he whittled down all his trees and everything to completely right. Right. abstract shapes. Yeah. So you like that. I and, do. And this is great because of the reference. Yeah. And it's also connected to Carl Little, which is great. Um, some of you may know Carl Little as uh, author and... Um, and poet. And poet. And um, who wrote one of the essays in my book. And he, I happened to be on Facebook, and he posted a picture like this. Th this was the... He had posted this. The guys weren't in it. I put the guys in. Um, and I quickly texted... Carl and I say, Carl, can I use your photograph? Because I've I've absolutely have to do a painting of this. Because this is <laughs> this is the ice fishing shack that Mondrian would have had if he I, it did ice fishing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. It's a good story. Okay, this is called Learning to Play. It's forty by sixty. Now this is getting bigger even. Oh, actually, it's thirty by forty. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, got the yep. wrong. T sorry. Okay, um, and this is I think a study of light coming in the windows. Yes. Yeah, that and also um, the objects that, that um, it's a children's reading room at the, at the Hancock Point Library up near where I live. And it's, it's a study of light and also sort of those interesting cubes and so forth, really playing with um, some neutral colors, but also these uh, bits of, of brighter, brighter color in those patterns. Mm. The air coming in. Yeah. 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 And that's the, what, like, the whole library was, the big screens and then those awning windows. Yeah. I love rooms with windows like this theater. Yes. Andrew made these windows or had them made so we could open them. It's wonderful. Okay, this one's called Ode to Rothko and Picasso. Mm -hmm. I see Rothko up in those windows. Yeah. Where's Picasso? Where's Picasso? Yeah. <laughs> He's not in one of the boats. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's basically the facets and sort of the, the blockiness of, of the boats mm -hmm. on, on the bow and the stern and, and the sides of the boat. Um, and, you know, Rothko is the windows. I think someone had, a friend of mine had, had seen me painting that and said, wow, those look like little mini Rothko paintings. <laughs> and it's like, yes, I'm going to really play that up. <laughs> okay, this was called Green on Green, and I don't know the size of this one, do you? Uh, I think that is 24 by 36, yeah. Greens can be difficult. Yes. I think you, you got them pretty right in this. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, this is in uh, Vermont. I show in a gallery in Middlebury, Vermont, so I did some painting out there, and that was, a, that was a bit of a challenge, all those greens. Oh, yeah, really. I yeah. think greens can be hard. Yeah. yeah. All right, this one's called A Few... No, Winter Light. And it's 30 by 40? Is that right? Yes. Yep. This is very abstract, but has a wonderful feeling to it. Yeah, this is another piece that was out behind my house, but in the wintertime. Mm. During COVID? No, a couple of years ago. Yeah, a couple of years ago. This is called Patterns and Piers. And I think it's the same 30 by 40. Yes. Yep. This what, is what's a day in your life like? How do you start the day? Do you meditate first? Do, yep. you, do you every day? Yes, yep, yep. every day. Um, do you get up early? Um, I, fairly early. I try to get up around 6 o'clock or so, mm -hmm. something like that. And... Um, you know, have 
have a little bit of tea and a and piece of toast or something and then meditate and then how um, long do you meditate um anywhere from a half hour to an hour something like that yeah and um and then you know go get some exercise and then breakfast and then into the studio or or out out painting outside or yeah yeah and yeah. how long how many hours a day do you say you paint it's prob when I'm sort of on a roll and I don't have other stuff to do, like mm -hmm. other framing things or... Uh, it's do you frame your own? Uh, I have a couple that makes the frames for me. Mm -hmm. um, they're a, uh, cabinet makers, mm -hmm. and so they make them to my specifications, and then I just put them, put the paintings in the frames. Uh, so it's, it's, I don't actually, you know, create the whole thing, which is great. Um, so then probably like four, four or five hours, something like that. Uh, four or five hours every day? Um, most every day, yeah. 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 What about the weekends? Weekends I try to take off. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez, I can't open this. <laughs> you got it? You need some help? I got it. I think. So uh, do you make your own food? I mean, do you cook your own meals? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Except when um, together with... With my girlfriend, we make meals together. Mm -hmm. Okay, this one is called Slip of Light. Mm. And uh, again, these blocks of color and buildings are perfect for that. Mm. Mm -hmm. But I love the way the light, you've made the light the subject. Yes. I, I think that's sort of my two main things is the sort of the color and... Uh, playing with the color and, and the light, you mm -hmm. know, both of those. And this is downtown Portland. And I actually made up some buildings in there to make the painting work, so. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oops. <laughs> for those it's okay, who are it's for okay. Those who are looking on the left side of the painting, they're probably like, wait a minute, those, paint, <laughs> those buildings do not exist like that. <laughs> Oh, well, I'm glad you cheat once in a while. Yeah, all the time, all the time. <laughs> Some of us cheat a lot. Yeah. Okay, this is called Pink and Blue. You're, dra you're drawn to wharfs and docks yes. and working yeah. harbors. You yeah. like that. Yeah, I think it's the, it's the patterns that happen in those. Yep. Um, it's what I'm really drawn to, and it's, that's one of the huge things. And also sort of the, the working waterfront is just fascinating to me in terms of it's, it's a hard life, you know, yeah. being um, a fisherman and in that industry. And so, you know, hanging around some of those places, taking photographs and sketching and painting can be a very interesting environment to hang out in. Um, it's fun. It's fun, and the, sometimes the stories you hear and the comments you hear, it's like, it's like whoa. <laughs> you could write a book. <laughs> right, indeed. Well, you probably agree with Noel Coward, who said, work is more fun than fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we've come to the end of the slides. Um, in the bio I sent out, I neglected to say that, that, to mention that Phil is in the Green Hut Gallery as well as the other galleries I mentioned. So let me tell you, he's in the Green Hut Gallery in Portland, the Carver Hill Gallery in Camden, the Edgewater Gallery in Middlebury, Vermont, and the Courthouse Gallery up in Ellsworth. And he's having a show this summer, if you want to see some of this beautiful work, um, called Five Main Artists from June 15th to the 9th, July, 9th of July. That's correct. And there's an opening reception on June 30th, if you want to go, from 5 to 7. And it's... What, two hours drive? Yep. An hour and a yep, half? Yeah, two hours to Ellsworth. And uh, it's a fun place to go. It's in Ellsworth, Maine. Yeah, the courthouse gallery. Yep. So uh, that would be a, a fun trip to make. And if you can't go to the opening, you could go between now and June 9th and see his work and four yep. other Maine artists. Yep. Um, so does anyone have a question for Phil? Yes. Mary. Well, Phil, I'm very fortunate to have one of your originals. Oh, great. <laughs> several years ago. It's very small. Yeah. There was a, a, an exhibit of multiple artists at the old firehouse gallery. Yes. Yes. Yes, yeah. right here in town. Uh, so it's, I'm guessing, maybe six by ten inches or so. 
Uh huh. Absolutely adore it. Oh, thanks. Have it in my bedroom, as a matter of fact, and I see it all the time. Wonderful. When I go to sleep, I wake up. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes, yes. And yep. so it's a lot of gold and orange and coral, and mm -hmm. it, it's very softly flowing, and there's none of this um, blockiness mm. about, mm -hmm. about it, as you are also wonderfully painting now. Was that a period you went through when mm -hmm. you did the kind of landscape? Yes, it is. Did everyone oh, hear the question? Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, I, I went through, as all artists, you, you go through sort of transitions, periods, uh, you know, metamorphosis, metamorphosis, however you want to say it. And so during that period, I was working, I think it's when I was still working with acrylics, I believe. Um, I hadn't made the switch to oils at that point. So I really started out with uh, watercolor and then uh, acrylic and then oil and in that time I was really kind of playing with um, I had gone from sort of outlining things and uh, and then painting sort of the interiors of those shapes and then those outlines disappeared and I started working with sort of uh, more flowing shapes and now it's, as you pointed out, it's, it's more blocky. I'm kind of looking at the, trying to simplify things a little bit and also really getting in, as Jane was pointing out, sort of the, the process. And sometimes the brushes that I've used has changed too. Like I switched to um, what they call flats, which is, as you can imagine, it's flat. Um, and ra instead of, some brushes have sort of like, you know, this shape like this, and these are, you know. Square. Square yeah. edge. Um, a chisel edge and so I was really playing up these days I'm playing up that sort of shape yeah does that answer your question more or less well, very much so I, I assume that that was the case that like so many or maybe most artists you go through periods where you experiment with different, mm -hmm. different things but yes you. you're welcome that's you're what welcome. keeps you interested I think it's yeah changing mm -hmm. yes Yeah. So Let me repeat the question so people can hear it. Uh, you asked, how many paintings does he work on at one time? And how do you know when a painting is finished? And there was one other question. Um, do, nope. you ever, do you ever throw a painting, you ever throw uh, a painting away if it doesn't work? Yeah. Uh, typically, I probably have like three paintings going at once in different stages of, of completion. And I usually paint them... Uh, I, I like painting wet and wet, which means the, as you might imagine, the, the paint is still wet and I'm putting on more layers of paint so I'm able to push stuff around. Like the paintings we saw earlier, li uh, liquid movement and liquids and solids, those are really good examples of that sort of wet and wet kind of uh, thing. Um, and it's, uh, so what was the other question? Um, uh, do you ever throw anything away? Oh, do that I ever throw? Work? Yeah. Well, I've I sometimes give paintings away. Um, other times, I will paint over them. Like I, there's stacks of paintings in my studio that are sort of sitting in various places, and uh, sometimes I will sand them down and then paint over it if I don't think it's um, if it's successful. And how do you know when they're finished? Right. Yeah. That the that's a big. Question yeah, for every artist. <laughs> every artist would. Um, <laughs> I think when. I think when I'm content, when I feel like I'm content with the piece. If I walk in, like there's a whole process for me, and maybe it's the same for you, Jane. Is that. I have my I have my easel set up so when I go back to my house and I come back, I can see it walking into the studio, and I get a different vantage point of of the painting and from that distance I can tell if it's if I go yeah that's that's done 
then I know it's done. If I sort of have to hem and haw about it, I know it's not done and I need more work. And sometimes some paintings, they take a long time to, to complete, whereas other ones feel like they've just sort of almost flown right up, you know, they've painted themselves almost. Yeah. Um, like I wasn't in the way, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, Lois Dodd had an interesting answer to that question. She said, when I feel like going back in and correcting something, yes. I know I'm done. Yes. Isn't that, that amazing? <laughs> that's a really good answer. It's the same thing because I tell my students that as they, I tell them to step away, from, drop, put the brush down, step away from the painting, don't fiddle. And so I have to remind myself to do the same thing is if I feel like I'm just going through the motions or fiddling on something, I know I'm going to mess the painting up because yeah. it's going to lose its, its energy. Right. There's a question over here. Um, um, she's talking about a library painting. Was this up in? It was the King, one. The, the painting of the. the oh, the library. Yes, the kids. You want? She. He wanted to know if that rug was really blue, or if he. And did he get permission to go in there and paint? Um, I didn't paint it in in person. Um, I took photographs of that one, and um, it was fairly accurate. Uh, the color I did dull some colors, and you know intensify some other ones. The rug was blue? The rug was blue, <laughs> yeah. A Emily. How did you handle your own uh, promotion when you were starting out? Like, yeah. How, how well, did you promote yourself is a question. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, well, I started locally. The advice that I got from other artists that I had met and uh, my high school art teacher and then my professors in college, they said, start locally and work out from there. So I basically, I, when I live, we lived in Franklin for a little bit, which is uh, northeast of Ellsworth, I showed in the Franklin Trading Post. I showed watercolors and I started doing house portraits. Um, and then I expanded from there. And uh, I did uh, postcard mailings and and I still do those to, to some extent. Um, and now it's, it's a cooperation between myself and galleries. Good way to start though, mm -hmm. locally and move out. Yeah, I mean, I think it's key because if you, you're making connections locally when you're doing that, and you, if you, it, it's, I think it's a lot like um, you're, when you throw a pebble in the water, the ripples start where the pebble is and mm. goes outwards. Mm. And, um, it doesn't go the opposite way around, mm. and so. Yeah. Uh, okay, Brooke? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about your color selection. Mm. Okay, the question is, uh, how do you choose your colors? Do you do it spontaneously, intuitively, or do you really limit yourself to what you're looking at? Is that what you mean? Yeah, in other words, you choose colors that seem to be the work, and then deal with just those two colors. Mm -hmm. I do both. Oh. I do both. Sometimes I will intentionally limit the palette to a, a narrow range of colors. And other times I just start painting and see, and see what happens. And um, I like doing both because it, it, it challenges me in different ways. Um, you know, if, if you have all the colors at your disposal, it, it's a, there's a certain challenge to that. And then there's another certain challenge when you limit it that you, you, you stretch your painting chops, so to speak, when you have a very limited set of colors to work with. You, you discover what happens when you mix this color with that color. Um, and I've known some artists that will actually do what they call a blind palette, where they'll reach into their box oh, of God. paint and pull it out and see what they've got. <laughs> and it's like, woo! <laughs> and see what, that, what that happens with all those blues or all those greens or whatever. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. 
but that's painting. Yeah. Wait, right here was one. Why are greens difficult? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I don't know quite how to answer that. Well, yeah. I know what I feel. I think yeah. that because green is such a beautiful color yeah. and there's so many shades of it, yeah. and the colors that you get, paint colors just, you have to really be careful because you can get too garish very quickly. Yeah. So I find that it's hard to get uh, something that's really uh, appealing. Yeah with green I would agree I mean feeling. I find that I have I have three different greens in my palette usually there's uh, Viridian um, there's sap green um, and then maybe like a, a cadmium green and so with those three I can get a lot of different greens and um, and I think it's what you said, Jane, it's, there's such a huge range of greens. When you look at green, it's just, I mean, this huge range of all kinds of colors, but, but for some reason, you know, it's, and it's, it, it can be, I guess, a little tricky in that. Um, and if, you, it, yeah, so. <laughs> yes. Yes. If you have yeah. three paintings going at the same time, do you have a standard palette for those three paintings? Yes, I do. Um, I usually work in uh, sort of themes or series of work. So I will do sort of a series of interiors. I'll do a series of landscapes um, and in particular landscapes. So it usually works out that I have that same palette happening. Um, so it, it tends to work out that way. Sometimes it, it doesn't work out and then I have to sort of clean my palette. But I do have a set, more or less a set group of uh, colors and then I choose from, the, from those for, for the painting. It's over here. Nice, oh. excellent. He's one of the people who jumped <laughs> off the dock. <laughs> nice. Oh, Gail Colby? No, it doesn't ring a bell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for telling us that. Yeah, that's great. Anybody? Did I miss anyone? Um, please thank uh, Damon uh, Liebert, who's up in the control room, who makes these beautiful big images come and look so great on the screen. Thank, Thank you, Damon. Damon. And if you haven't bought Phil's book and are interested in buying it, there's more for sale down at the lobby or the entrance. So thank you so thank much you, for Jane. coming. This is We've wonderful. enjoyed it thank so you. much. Really, really good. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you, everyone.